Hello and welcome. It is my pleasure to welcome you all to the first in our series of food strategy for your city. My name is Florence Pardo from the Food Foundation and the Food Cities 2022 Learning Partnership, which my colleague Charlene will be telling you more about shortly. Um, it's an honour and a delight to be welcoming representatives from so many cities around the world today, including a great many from India, thanks to our partnership with Eat Right India and their amazing Eat Smart Cities Challenge, which you'll be hearing about at the end of today's webinar. In this series, we're going to be learning about how a city can create a food strategy, from who is involved, to what goes into it, to how to implement and deliver it in your city. Hopefully many of you were able to watch the introductory video ahead of today's webinar, which looked at why cities are developing strategies. And if not, we'll be providing a link at the end and you'll be able to catch up on that useful bit of context setting before our next webinar. In each of our webinars, we'll be hearing from one knowledge speaker who might be a researcher or someone from a national or international non-governmental organization and is an expert in the topic and then three practitioner speakers who are actively working on food policy or projects in their own cities and will be sharing case studies and expertise and experience to inspire your work in your own city. Each speaker will be presenting for about 10 minutes and then we'll have a short Q&A session. So please feel free to put your questions in the chat. Please remember to keep yourselves on mute during the presentations. Uh, and just to let you know, we are recording this session. So please, Turn off your camera if you don't wish to be filmed. So it's my pleasure to hand over to my colleague Shalin Milu, who is a special advisor on city food policy and engagement um, and the engagement lead for the uh, learning partnership. Thanks very much. Over to you, Shalin. Um, thank you, Florence, and thank you everybody for joining us um, this morning. It's just such an exciting um, thing to see so many different people um, supporting this initiative and some familiar faces as well. So the partnership builds upon um, work that was facilitated by the Food Foundation between a city in the UK, Birmingham, and a city in India, Pune. Um, and this was launched about, I think it's four years ago now. And um, both cities um, committed to working together to develop city food, um, a city food strategy and actions that would enable, <coughs> excuse me, their citizens to make healthier, more sustainable food choices. And the exciting thing for us was that the cities were really engaged, including the political and political leads and senior officers. Um, last year, we secured additional funding to expand the partnership um, across the Commonwealth and beyond. And we have also established um, relationships with um, the Milan Urban Food Policy Pact Secretariat who are on the call today and other partners like the Prince's Foundation also on the call today to develop tools and resources that will support cities to get on to this journey of developing healthier, more sustainable food policies. So I'm going to leave it at that. We welcome you and we look forward to develop and developing an equal relationship and partnership as we move forward together. Fantastic. Thank you so much for that, Charlene. So uh, it's my pleasure to introduce our first speaker for today. Dr. Yeruan Kandel works as an associate professor in food and agricultural policy at Wageningen University in the Netherlands. As a, as a researcher, he looks at how governments from local to international levels can support a transition towards a more sustainable food system with a particular focus on the potential of urban food strategies. And besides his work as a researcher, Dr. Kandel works with policymakers and stakeholders to provide suggestions for improved food governance. And he's also been part of setting up a really great online platform at Table, which is full of great information on positive food system change uh, and can be found at tabledebates.org. So well worth um, having a look at. Dr. Kandel is our knowledge speaker for today, and we'll be talking about the choices that local governments around the globe have made in developing food strategies, as well as their motivations and frequent challenges. Thank you very much. Over to you. Thank you, uh, Florence. And it's a, it's a big pleasure to be here today with so many people from uh, across the globe being present who share an interest in uh, urban food policy. Let me just uh, enlarge my, uh, my screen. So, um, my name is uh, Jeroen Kandel. I'm an associate professor at Wageningen University in the Netherlands. 
Um, and I, I'm a political scientist by training, but I'm specialized in, in the field of food and agricultural uh, policy. So the overarching question that I try to tackle in my research is the question of, okay, how can governments do better uh, in, in steering food systems uh, towards more sustainable and just outcomes? Um, and apart from my, my role as a researcher, as a teacher, I also frequently advise governments uh, across the globe, but especially in, in Europe, uh, about how they can foster such a, a transition. Uh, and today I would like to share some of the insights from our research on urban food policy with you, uh, which I hope will also help you to, um, well, as a, as, a, as a point of departure for uh, developing food strategies or uh, fostering food system change within your uh, respective uh, uh, um, um, uh, localities. So first question, uh, why would you want to invest in an urban food strategy in the first place? Well, I think um, many of you will be aware that our food system is under pressure and there are many challenges that relate uh, to the ways in which we produce and consume food, while at the same time there's also quite a diversity of challenges. Uh, I think um, and some parts of the world there's still very fierce food insecurity, hunger, uh, where, whereas in other parts of the world uh, um, um, uh, the environmental impacts of the food system are on the top of the uh, political agenda. But I think we can summarize or visualize the common challenge by, by looking at what we call the donut, uh, which is borrowed by uh, the idea of the donut economy by the uh, British economist Kate Raworth, um, uh, in which we aim to move towards a food system that on the one hand respects the social foundation that we strive for, uh, so provide food security to all, um, and healthy diets and make sure that labor conditions in the, in the food chain are, are fair, are just, while at the same time also respecting the planetary boundaries, the ecological ceilings uh, by reducing climate emissions, uh, by improving biodiversity, etc. So the, the sort of donut, that uh, space in between the social foundation and the ecological ceiling uh, is the space, is the food system that we aim for. And of course, the main challenges uh, that need to be tackled will differ uh, um, across countries, across, uh, across cities. But this is the common challenge. Now, why then take action at local level? Um, well, first of all, because many of these challenges become most visible at, at, at local level. Uh, I think if we talk about food insecurity, uh, if we talk about environmental impacts, uh, at the local level is really um, 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 the level where, well, policymakers can make a real difference. Uh, also given the fact that there's still ongoing urbanization across the world, uh, especially also in, uh, in, in many emerging countries. Well, at the same time, we, you might also argue that, um, and this is a, a, an argument made by a, by a well-known political scientist from the US, Benjamin Barber, uh, that it might also be way more effective to take action at local level. He wrote a famous book, If Mayors Rule the World, arguing that, well, perhaps national governments have become increasingly dysfunctional. Uh, uh, perhaps that's more true in some countries than in others. Um, but, but he expects that much more can be achieved in improving food security, in tackling climate change at local level compared to national or even international levels. Uh, so you could say that the local level is really emerging as a venue, uh, uh, well, in, in which we can um, um, uh, really uh, make, make a difference uh, across the globe. I think uh, many of you will also have heard of the Milan Urban Food Policy Pact, uh, which started in 2015. And I think Andrea will, will talk later uh, today uh, to share some of their experiences. Uh, which is also a global network of mayors who committed to fostering, to improving uh, the food system within their respective territories. Now, a bit of a more theoretical or abstract question, what do we mean with a food strategy in, in, in the first place? Uh, so this whole webinar is about developing food strategies, but what does a food strategy actually entail? So uh, in my research, I defined a food strategy as an overarching framework that explicitly sets out integrated food policy efforts across an administration sectors 
possibly in interaction with broader governance networks. Well, this is quite, quite a bit, eh? but it basically means that you develop a strategy uh, that sort of transcends the, the, the different policies and policy domains within an administration that relate to the functioning of the food system. So food policy is not just about uh, increasing agricultural production eh, or about tackling uh, health disparities or, or improving uh, food security, and but it's really about developing an integrated vision on how to improve the food system as, as a whole, tackling these interconnected challenges in, in a more coherent manner. Uh, and of course, that's not only for government to do on its own, uh, but also to, to collaborate on with, uh, with other actors, uh, such as uh, uh, farmer representatives, NGOs, etc. Now, I already mentioned, and of course, uh, uh, there's a huge variation in terms of uh, what to focus on in, in, in a local food strategy, because challenges will differ. Um, cities across the world have different competencies. Uh, uh, some, so some cities might, for example, have, have strong competencies on ra raising taxes, while others cannot. Political priorities might differ. Uh, I think the policymakers among you will 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 uh, know very well that the, the the options that you have also depend on on well sort of the uh, preferences of your political masters institutional capacities and so in practice there will be very large differences in terms of the goals and instruments that will be uh, um, at the center of these these food strategies um, I, I here um, uh, show uh, the toronto food strategy uh, and the one of belo horizonte in in brazil which is seen as a which are both seen as pioneers in urban food strategy, and while at the same time focusing, also having different emphasis in what they focus on. Uh, Belo Horizonte, for example, focusing a lot on, on food, uh, food security. Uh, Toronto, also much more on, on, on public health, healthy diets, etc. Now, um, a couple of years ago, I performed a study of, um, uh, of all the cities that subscribe to the Milan Urban Food Policy Pact. And I looked at, okay, which of these cities, uh, in addition to subscribing to the Milan Urban Food Policy Pact, also developed food strategies at home? Right? Because, of course, it's really nice if you subscribe to the pact. But what really matters is, is whether you also make a change at home right? and start doing things differently. And developing a food strategy is a start in, 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 in doing so, or at least could be. So I'd like to share some of the key insights from, from this st study. And the first is that we see that food strategies are, are much more common in the global north compared to the global south, uh, with pre perhaps the exception of Latin America. So we see that especially in Brazil, Colombia, Mexico, uh, there's quite a number of strategies uh, of cities that have developed integrated food or food security strategies. Um, uh, Johannesburg in, in Africa, Windhoek in Namibia, are the only ones uh, on, on the African continent. Uh, whereas uh, I know many of you are from India. Well, I think there's quite, quite some work uh, to do for you eh? because India at this moment or at, at the moment of the, when the study was, uh, was carried out, uh, and there were no cities in, in India that already had a, um, a, a, an urban food strategy. And the same applies to the rest of, uh, of, of the Asian continent. continent. Now, there's also quite some variety in terms of the types of strategies that cities have developed. In some cases, in, in the majority of cases, so of the 41 cities that had a, a strategy, 23 really had an elaborate program or, or visions um, with different legal statuses. Some really adopted formal laws, especially in Latin America, where they really adopted a local law on improving food security. Well, not all cities across the globe have this competence of adopting these kind of laws, whereas others adopted more, well, shorter brochures or, or manifestos uh, while still carrying out a number of, of activities. And then there's a last category of cities that did not develop a, a food strategy, but that developed a resilient strategy in which they had a whole chapter on, on, on food, on food system. Now, if we look at the, at the goals, and I hope that, that this is large enough for you to read, but we see again that there's quite a large diversity in the goals that cities uh, focus on, but that a large ma majority focuses on in improving local food production and consumption. So fostering short uh, food chains, uh, urban agriculture, uh, this is really something that we see 
um, um, recurring across uh, across the globe. Other goals that that are uh, included very often are are uh, making agriculture more sustainable, um, uh, helping local or regional farmers, uh, economic development. Uh, so also seeing the food sector as a way of improving uh, uh, the, the the local economy. While some others, like um, uh, retail or, or, or health, are mentioned less frequently. Then in terms of instruments, we see that most cities rely on, on software instruments. So on informing um, um, uh, consumers, producers, on using some subsidies, while the use of regulation, uh, of really making hard rules, uh, is, is much less uh, common. I'm going through this a bit quickly, uh, uh, but if you, you're interested, you can of course look up the study later on. Uh, I'd be also be happy to, uh, to share it with you. But to, sh to, to end with some of the key conclusions uh, of our study, uh, we see that most uh, cities uh, have really managed to develop overarching strategies in which they target these different dimensions of the food system, uh, from production to consumption uh, and, and some of the, uh, the activities in between. Although uh, the Food retailing, uh, we call that uh, food supply and distribution, often remains underaddressed. Uh, and Roberto Sonino, a colleague from, uh, from uh, Cardiff, has, mentioned, has referred to this as the missing middle of the food chain. Well, we've seen quite large differences in the legal status, but also the level of detail. Uh, some cities have very broad objectives, but where it's quite difficult to monitor if they've actually achieved them, whereas others are, are way more targeted. So I think a common challenge is First of all, developing these urban strategies, but then also making sure that you move beyond symbolic policy. Yeah? So not only um, um, keep this or, or develop these as paper paper tigers, yeah? paper strategies, but also make sure that these strategies and also really make a difference in uh, fostering food system change. So that's quite a bit in these uh, these ten minutes, but I hope I've been able to share some some new insights. Uh, thanks a lot for your attention, and I look forward to uh, to the questions or points of uh, of discussion that you uh, may have. Over to you, uh, Florence. Fantastic. Thank you very much. That was really, really um, insightful and useful information, and I'd highly recommend that study. It's actually how I came across Dr. Kandel's work, um, and it's really useful, so I will be sure to, um, to share that with you all. Um, in our follow-up email. So I'm now going to hand over to um, Andrea Margarini, who is the coordinator of the Milan Food Policy. And in this role, he works to engage partners across the city from public sector, third sector and private sector to implement actions on a suite of activities to transform the food system of the city. He's also uh, the chair of the Food Working Group of EuroCities, which is a network of 51 European cities actively working on food policy development. And Andrea will be sharing insights on how cities are developing their food policy processes with Milan as a case study. Thank you very much, over to you. Thank you, thank you indeed for us for his uh, invitation and also it's a pleasure to follow also the, the words of uh, Jerome. And um, I'm here also, it's connected also Filippo Gavazzini from the Milan uh, Park Secretariat. Um, and uh, I, I will share, as, uh, as anticipated from Florence, uh, some insights from uh, uh, Milan. I take some time, but uh, I'll try also to share my screen. Okay, seems that it's work. Uh, as uh, already presented, there are a huge uh, topic of urbanization in our uh, world, and uh, there are different kinds of food systems at global level, European, national, regional, and also at local level. Uh, in our case, when we speak about uh, local level, as already presented, uh, we have this kind of uh, international agreement among cities uh, that are working to develop uh, urban food policy at local level and is uh, uh, the participation of this uh, Milan urban food policy pact that is now participating from more than 200 cities. Some cities, as uh, Jerome presented, are more active than the others. So about 50 cities have a dedicated uh, urban food policy approved and uh, there are uh, a pioneering cities among them that are working uh, a lot uh, on urban food system. 
one uh, times per um, yearly uh, we we met uh, in a global forum and is an occasion to share in person experiences with workshop and uh, with practices with uh, the other colleagues uh, after this uh, quickly update on the milan herman food policy pact let me show the example of milan uh, we started in 2014 to understand our food system and to define our local commitment uh, to, to, to improve the sustainability of our city region food system. So we started, we divide our process in three main parts, a part of uh, an understanding of our food system, so the, the analysis of the food system, a public consultation in which we engage local actors uh, from university, civil society, private sector and other public institution. And after the, the deliberation of our city council, council with a definition of a dedicated food policy. So we start to have an assessment of our food system uh, by understanding the different scales. So we have a scale at urban level, a scale at metropolitan level with different actors that are working on this system. And we start with a uh, uh, conceptualization of the different main elements. So uh, an element for the accessibility, for the culture of food, for the environmental quality, and also to innovation. And we try to define and understand and share in knowledge among all of our actors and to collect the already existing knowledge in this uh, field of food system. After we try to understand the different stages of this food system, so the different uh, element, elements that uh, uh, moving the food beyond the city. Uh, so all the elements regarding production, transformation, logistics, uh, distribution, consumption and waste. And as you can see also in this infographic, we understand the food system as a system, as a circle, not as a line from production to consumption, but to understand all the different elements, all the different stages of our food system. And also based on this, uh, we try to understand all the different relation that are working on uh, the six main elements of our food system. And in that period, so 2014, we work also to understand for all of these elements uh, our existing uh, urban policies delivered from a municipality and also delivered from other institutions. For instance, on the field of production, we have uh, an agricultural park that is participated also from our municipality. And in this agricultural park are working uh, 1,000 and a half of farmers. So is one of the main driver in the field of urban production and per-urban production. In the field of logistics, uh, we have a municipal agency that manage our wholesale food general market. In the field of consumption, everything concerning public meals. So the meals from school canteens, the meals from hospital canteens, and in field of waste, uh, all the infrastructure that manage this, uh, this waste and also are the main driver to work against food waste. Based on all of this knowledge, we try to collect data because only if you know very well your context, only if you know the different elements of your food system, you can improve them. And so here is in Italian, but is a, a, a set of uh, huge database from different, there is a, an open microphone, uh, a, a set of data from different database, from different uh, partners that we try to engage to understand the percentage of obesity, the percentage, the percentage of food poverty, uh, where the people in Milan are buying their food, the different element about logistics. So it's just a, a snapshot to have an idea that is very important to collect data to understand your context. And after this, we try to connect the different public competencies. On this infographic with the different colors, with the different flux. Please, thank you. 
we 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 organize a, a set of interviews uh, with uh, different uh, deputy mayors uh, in Milan uh, to understand in a different topic uh, what are their perceptions. So with these infographics, we try also to understand uh, what kind of policy are already established and what of what kind of uh, urban competencies uh, are spread among the different deputy mayors. And then uh, we, we, we try to, to put all of this know-how in a simple uh, metric. So uh, again, you can uh, understand the different stages of the food system. And here are some elements that we try to understand. So the data already mentioned, the institutional role of the municipality, because if we need to define our commitment to improve our food system, we need to understand <laughs> There is another micro, please, if, if you can mute. Thank you. Um, we need to understand the institutional role of a municipality. As already mentioned, we have a, a very strong power in some specific infrastructure, some uh, food infrastructure, for instance, food school canteen, waste management, and so on. The, the set of the different policies that are connecting with the different uh, uh, food system elements and other other element but this set of uh, uh, element cross-cutting element can be different in different contexts again is a tool that uh, allowing you to map the local actors and uh, and then we try to collect all of this kind of knowledge in uh, 10 main issues that uh, are here listed. So governance, education, waste, access to food, wellness, environmental, agroecosystem, production, trade, and finance. And uh, we produce uh, a simple document um, in which uh, we try to explain also for other actors uh, the complexity of our food system. And uh, per each uh, of these uh, of these elements, we produce uh, a simple uh, uh, scheme that are here uh, in, in Italian, but uh, it's just to have an idea of the different elements and the different policy briefs that we produce with some data, with some description of these specific issues, with the ongoing activities of our municipality and with the ongoing activities of uh, the different actors and uh, not uh, public. And then uh, an element that connect uh, this specific uh, uh, priority with the others. Based on this uh, document, we try to organize our uh, public consultation. So here again, the document, uh, and we organize a set of uh, stakeholder engagement activities online and offline. So our, our sectorial meetings with uh, universities, with uh, NGOs, with charities, and then with all of them together in a town meeting to try to work together uh, by, we, for the definition uh, of uh, a unique uh, food policy. Here again, uh, the, the kind of consultation that we organized. And finally, the, a, docu a document about our food policy. So our city council uh, in a different round of consultation defined five priorities that are ensuring healthy food and surface and drinking water for each citizen, promoting sustainability of food system, promoting food education, fight against food waste and support the scientific research. Uh, this document was approved by our city council and is a set of 16 guidelines for improve our food system. And here you can see some, uh, some photos of uh, that movement. So the public consultation and also the final deliberation of our city council. Uh, just to wrap up, so to define uh, our food policies, we need to uh, have a strong commitment of our municipalities that can become a platform for the cities itself, but we need first to understand our food system. The, the way in which we can understand the food system are very different uh, from uh, collecting knowledge from our partner to, ex to, ex to exploit the already existing knowledge within our municipal uh, bodies. And uh, then we need to explore 
have a political commitment from, uh, for instance, a vice mayor of a mayor itself or a deputy mayor, and then to establish technical structure within the municipality to, to facilitate uh, all of the technical uh, staff uh, uh, to, to work uh, uh, towards uh, uh, urban food policy. We are not alone because, as already mentioned, the Milan Urban Food Policy Path collect more than 200 cities that are working in the same field and participating in that community. And those, uh, in a webinar like today is a powerful tool to share knowledge. Thank you again for the invitation and Florence, up to you. Thank you so much, Andrea. That was really, really comprehensive overview of a, of, of a strategy and lots of those issues we're going to be covering in the series from, from data to engaging stakeholders. So thank you so much for that introduction um, to strategies and on to our next speaker, Angela Blair. Um, Angela is a public health nutritionist who's been working in public health and on food policy in the borough of Sandwell in the West Midlands of England for the last two decades where she and her team have achieved some amazing, uh, amazing things. Sandwell was one of the first local authorities in the UK to publish a food strategy, and that's led to a programme of initiatives being developed in the area. And she's recently started as food policy coordinator in Brighton, in the southeast of the UK, which has a population double that of Sandwell and is the leading city in the UK for food strategy and policy. And Angela's going to share insights from her work in both of these settings. Thank you. Over to you. Hi there. I'll just get my screen up. And if you could let me know if that's presenting full screen. Not just yet. Okay. And is that big enough? That's great. Lovely. Thank you. Hi there. Thank you so much for inviting me today. It's a real pleasure and privilege to meet you all. Thanks for turning up. My name's Angela Blair and I'm a food policy coordinator. I've just started work in the very south of England in Brighton and Hove, and I work for a city council. And I previously worked in the West Midlands of England, so I wanted to share a story about two places. So really today I wanted to share a food policy development journey from past to the present and into the future using some case studies from these two places. Sometimes it's useful to look back to the past when we're trying to move and create a new future. So as the presentations you've already heard have already detailed and illustrated, a food strategy is a vision for the kind of food system we should be building for the future and a plan for how to achieve that vision. So way back, well, I, I arrived in um, the food policy job in the West of England, um, really 21 years ago now. <laughs> and at that time, we were looking to places that you've just heard about. We were looking to the work of Toronto and Belo Horizonte in Brazil and trying to learn what we could. And, at that time, there was a local agenda 21 strategy, which was an action plan arising from the Earth Summit, the UN's um, conference held in Rio de Janeiro in Brazil. That was way back in 1992. But from that, we had a basic sustainable food policy. And the vision was to improve people's access to affordable food, affordable good quality food, and to develop the link between the people of Sanwell and the food producers in the West Midlands region. That was very important for us. And a lot of the sustainable food policy was around procurement and things that the, the institution of the council could do, but it's, it span wide to um, community agriculture and community involvement and schools, etc. So from that, our local strategic partnership that was the the bigger partnership body in our area the area it's not a city it was a smaller area so our local strategic partnership it requested a food policy and it specifically requested a food policy on two sides of paper um, which you can see here and you can see the vision 
and you can very importantly here it was about being underpinned with community involvement but strong focus on sustainable development and touching on many of the things you've just heard about but on the right hand side you can see the goals each of those goals had action plans there was a number of task groups working groups and involving a wide range of partners traders associations community development um, had links to all different local organizations so we did have a, a basic governance body we had a food policy board with senior leadership and we had wide representation cross-sectoral representation but also there was a regional food policy group that ran in the area for a good decade and a half and even though that was within public sector um, it still was able to transfer and share knowledge so it's important to establish cross-department agency partnerships and forums so engaging policymakers and securing senior level commitment. Our initial work that engaged um, policymakers at the highest level was really a, an audit of the local food economy, a mapping that revealed that there was a lot to be done to improve access to healthy, affordable food. And such work, such research was noticed and taken up by various plans. You can see there the urban design directory in 2009 and 10 and um, also the continuous productive urban landscape research. Now I'm just going to leap to the present um, where I've just started work in Brighton and this area has very strong foundations and a very well developed um, food partnership. So the Bright the work that I'm describing now was done by an independent body, the Brighton and Hove Food Partnership, and all its partners, a wide range across the city. So the vision they've illustrated here about having healthy, sustainable, fair food for all, again, all the key areas that we've heard about before, but put in a very simple, communicable way. Um, and you can see that how do you move from that vision for your aims, your outcomes, and the actual impact. It is an extensive document, and you know, every, every aim and action is followed through with an action plan. What I find most important about this area I've come to work in is the approach, the roots of a successful food strategy. They really are highlighted in this diagram about having a food partnership, as you've just heard with the Milan Urban Food Policy Pact, to have an action plan. How do you move from your vision to your actions to be part of? Well, for us, it was um, in the UK, there's sustainable food cities as a, a national network, but that may be Milan. It may be um, through Euro cities, for example, or another international network make it about your place be confident in your city and be confident in your citizens and the other sector actors adopt at a strategic level so getting it on agendas and prevention is better than cure so engaging policymakers and securing senior level commitment very much in brighton the focus is with climate action um, and food is seen as the missing ingredient for tackling the climate and ecological emergency. So a lot of the conversations and actions are framed in this direction. And we know we all need to be doing this work. So again, just to um, support what was said previously, local, regional or sub-regional, national and international level governance is necessary. You know, very early on, as I said, um, 20 years ago, we didn't have a Milan Urban Food Policy Pact or Euro, Euro cities that we would align with, but we, there was the Agenda 21 and we had our local version, regional and sub-regional, we had our group to transfer knowledge. Nationally, it was more about health 
um, the documents that were coming out, it was difficult to talk about food systems. But internationally, as I said, looking towards Toronto and um, Bello, um, Bello Horizonte as well, there was a lot of leadership. So just um, coming to my last slides now, key challenges. <laughs> Um, you can see, and everybody knows, it's very complex. There's so many interlinkages and any direction that we could follow, but some key moments. For example, this diagram to the left was when The Lancet, a, a well-known medical journal, um, had done an, they did an obesity series document where they had this illustration, an infographic, about how can government support healthy food preferences. And it's not perfect, but at that time, it allowed our decision makers and key actors to realize it was possible. And this was a very important moment. So finding a way to move from the complex to, to something that people can um, feel is doable and to act on, and also to highlight um, we needed to ensure that community involvement was truly at the heart. So national work looking at um, inequalities and food poverty, really, we, the food policy actions were redefined and the narrative shifted to a food power action plan. So this slide here, I just wanted to put in to say it in some ways, your narrative might be as simple as this, to do with a circular economy about sourcing food regeneratively and locally where appropriate, designing and marketing healthier food products and making the most of food. Timing is really important and there couldn't be a better time than now to get involved in this work. Um, I've highlighted some, um, our national food strategy in the UK, part two is just about to be published. Um, there's a Glasgow Declaration on Food and Climate Change. There's a lot being spent on big research funded projects. So this is a very good time to be involved. So that, that's all I wanted to share with you today. And I look forward to any questions that you might have. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you, Angela. That was really, really helpful, really insightful. Um, and lots of really great documents um, uh, and suggestions to look at there. I'd highly recommend having a look at the um, Brighton and Hove uh, strategy, which I'll be happy to share with you all as well. Just make sure. You're muted to Florence. Just spotted that, sorry about that. So it's my pleasure to introduce our last speaker for today, Dr. Tinashe Mushayaniyama, who's the Director of Integrated Policy and Planning and Research for the City of Johannesburg. He's a strategist, an economist, and a public administrator. And in the city of Johannesburg, food is recognized as a really significant part of the social development vision. And Dr. Mushayaniyama oversees research, policy analysis, review, and development, the monitoring and evaluation and the partnerships that support this vision. And today, Dr. Moshe Niyama will be talking on the process of reviewing and renewing and developing the city's food policy uh, 10 years after it was first written. Thank you very much, over to you. Thank you very much. Um, uh, am I audible enough? And I don't know, can you see the presentation? Yes, that's great, thank you. Okay, thank you very much and we are very, thrilled and happy to be part of this conversation from the city of Johannesburg. My name is uh, Tanashi. As you can see on the screen there, I am the director responsible for uh, policy planning and research in a department called social development. I'll touch on the location of um, the food security matters in the city of Johannesburg. But just to start um, by giving you the scope of the city of Johannesburg food resilience policy, which uh, was developed a couple of uh, years ago. Yes, indeed, we've got a policy in place, which is actually uh, governing the activities that relate to food security in the city of Johannesburg. But suffice to say that the policy is, is, is now very old and we are at a point when 
we are reviewing uh, the food resilience policy in the city of Johannesburg together with other pack of um, uh, policies that uh, we are uh, undertaking uh, in the city of Johannesburg. The food resilience policy in the city of Johannesburg is designed to assist all food insecure residents of uh, Johannesburg, particularly those that go without food, at least one meal between three and 10 days in a month. And I think it's very important to highlight that when you are developing policies uh, of this nature, you need to define who are you targeting? What are the target audience? And for us, this is the, the definition of the target audience for, for the policy that we have, which we I will discuss later where I see it as a gap uh, in terms of uh, the way it is actually framed, but it is part of the learning. I'm just sharing with you the experiences that uh, I've had in the implementation of this policy and what we think are some of the issues that need to be, to be taken care of. Um, my, my screen is not moving now, I'm not sure. Um, can you see any movement on your side? We can't. I can um, share your um, presentation from my end if you are having okay. trouble. Okay, now, ah. now, now, now I got it. Great. Now I've got it. Okay. So it is, um, uh, our policy is, is aimed at assisting uh, communities to grow their own food uh, through food uh, gardens uh, in the backyards or rooftops. Um, it is also, uh, aimed at providing small farmers uh, with means to access land. As you know that uh, we are talking about urban farming here and land is a key issue. Um, also, it is aimed at assisting farmers to access the markets. Uh, lastly, our food policy is aimed at attempting to provide a cheaper, fresh, uh, basic food to all people in Johannesburg through markets that are closed to where they live. So this is just an overview of what the policy entails and what the strategy that we are developing also entails. Um, in terms of, in terms of um, the leadership and the governance in the strategy development process, from the experience that we've seen in Johannesburg, um, there are a couple of questions that we need to answer. How do we engage with policymakers in securing senior level commitment? And for this particular question, we need to understand that in a political environment, uh, like cities uh, that are similar to Johannesburg, when you talk about commitment uh, of senior uh, 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 people in the, in the city, it's actually a two-pronged two um, approach. We have got the political leadership, and then we've got the executive. So for the city of Johannesburg, it is very important to understand the dynamics that you need to undergo in order to win uh, the buy-in of political leaders. And that is the council itself, as it is led by uh, uh, the speaker and the executive, as it is led by the uh, uh, executive mayor. So there is a need to lobby food security in the long-term growth and development strategies. In the city of Johannesburg, we've got a growth and development strategy that is in place, which is an overarching strategy for the city that actually gives a picture of how we would want to see Johannesburg uh, in the next 40 years, which was approved in 2010. And in that particular strategy, uh, food security matters, we had to undergo through a process of lobbying to ensure that they are actually captured as part of the bigger strategy of the city before we even consider developing a policy itself. And another very important matter that we've uh, uh, seen is that uh, we needed to lobby uh, the food security matters uh, uh, with the mayoral committee. Uh, in, the, in, the, in the city of Johannesburg and other cities in South Africa, uh, the governing party is now a, an issue of negotiated settlement in the sense that our, our political leadership now comprises, unlike before, um, uh, what we call the coalition governments, a, a government comprising other political parties coming together to form a government. And it is very important that 
when you lobby the food security in a mirror uh, 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 priorities of the city comprising different political parties, um, negotiations become very key and uh, in the understanding of the political manifestos of the different parties becomes also very key. In Johannesburg, our problem statement is centered around high levels of unemployment, uh, poverty and inequality. How do you get the political uh, commitment? Um, we need to do this uh, by lobbying various political uh, parties uh, who in their own right have got their own political capital. So we need to understand the mayoral, um, not the mayoral, we need to understand the manifestos of all the political parties and to ensure that the agenda that we put as food security is a negotiated settlement. I've already spoken about this. And for us to be able to do that, it is very important that we have evidence-based best research. Benchmarking is very key to frame a sellable uh, problem statement to various political parties. We have seen that uh, in, in many instances, the political uh, process that is required to arrive at a policy or a strategy can actually transcend various political administrations. You know, when you are in a, in, a, in a coalition government, anything can happen. You might start to review a policy today and within three months, another government is in place. So evidence-based research is very key to ensure that whatever you put as an agenda is, non, is, is actually not contestable. So those are some of the observations that we got in terms of the executive commitment that is getting commitment from our own executive mayor and other departments. Here, we talk of the transversal matters that are relevant in the food security environment. One of the uh, speakers has already alluded to that, to say that the food security, it actually transcends various departments, uh, departments and sectors. And we've actually observed that in the city of Johannesburg. So it is very important that uh, we locate the role of food security in achieving the outcomes of other departments, not only the department that is the custodian of the food security. Like in our case, food security uh, actually resides within social development, but it will be key going forward that we locate the outcomes of other departments and relate them to how food security can actually link to achieving their own objectives. Food security matters, they intersect with other departments. And as such, it is important that we identify the departments and engage with them explicitly. But engagement alone is not enough. We have actually seen that it's very important that those that are identified uh, as departments relevant, relevant to advancing food security are actually explicitly outlined in the policy or strategy itself. Because if you assume that it will happen organically, it might not happen. And we've seen that in many instances where uh, it will be very difficult to bring departments together. So to explicitly outline in policies and make sure that the endorsement of the policy is endorsed with the matrix of all the departments that are relevant is very key. Another very important matter is to identify other policies within cities or within our own city, which we have done, whose review must actually feature prominently the food security. So food security also transcends various policies within the city. And it is very important that we take note of that uh, so that when it comes to public participation or internal consultation of other policies that are being reviewed in cities, we make sure that we guard against the food security is one of the features that has, has to be taken care of. The location of the food security department is also one of the key issues that we need to take cognizance of. Uh, I've given the three examples there. In our case, it is located in social development and by virtue of being located in social development, it is seen as a role of assisting the vulnerable groups. And that one itself, it differs if you locate food security in a department like economic development. What it means then is that the perceptions of it being in economic development will bring in a sense of enterprising and a sense of sustainability where people can view it as a way of living. 
And the last point that I'm putting there under location is where we've been pondering about whether it should be in the mayor's office, which is the city, city manager's office. But once again, it, it brings in a political dimension in it. And, um, but however, it becomes easier to manage the transversal matters that uh, 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 actually come with it. Um, other things that we might need to consider uh, in the food security uh, uh, policy development um, is that the implementation must actually happen across all the departments. And in order to do that, for me, what I've seen is a key uh, ingredient there is that once you develop a policy of this nature or a strategy of this nature, you must actually come up with a corporate scorecard that is applicable to all the departments that you've identified as relevant. And then in this corporate scorecard, you must come up with the key indicators around food security to ensure accountability. And because it becomes part of the city performance management system, you will then have to force departments to compile their own specific indicators that are aligned to the corporate scorecard. So this is one of the key issues that we have observed that uh, it will be useful. And by so doing, uh, we are actually forcing each and every identified department to allocate some resources or a budget in its annual uh, motivations to address uh, food security. Some of the key considerations as I conclude uh, things to do with sustainability. In the city of Johannesburg, we have made a lot of emphasis around the food banks where we distribute the food parcels. But I think it is important that we understand that uh, sustainability goes beyond just providing food parcels. And therefore, we need to encourage innovative urban agriculture through training, rooftop uh, uh, gardens, and conversion of dubbing sites into food gardens. And the issue of the limited budget allocations is very important and how we've been dealing with it and how we intend to deal with it in the future is by partnerships and the inclusion of the departments as I've indicated before, that if all departments are included, then their little budgets will actually be working towards alleviating this particular problem. Um, another challenge that you might find is the misalignment in the spheres of government. At the local government, we are at the core phase of service delivery, and our strategic functions are influenced by the demands on the ground. While at the national sphere, uh, it is largely influenced by the international expectations and, and, and aspirations. An example is the issues around the late tenure in the city of Johannesburg, uh, where the arrangement is limited to five years, whereas at the national level, they consider nine years. So that in itself can tell you that we've got to navigate some of the misalignments here. And from our own research, we have actually realized that it takes over five years for someone to become profitable in this particular area. So therefore it is important to understand the international, regional and local discourse around the food security. Uh, the perceptions are very key. Perceptions, especially attracting the youth, into the program has been a challenge, yet there is great opportunity to make money through this particular uh, area of food security. We have seen that most of the youth, uh, they, they go for quick, quick cash, and our current cohort in the city of Johannesburg comprise elderly people. Uh, we need to consider other vulnerable groups. So as you consider your own policies or strategies, it is important to know that the uh, other Vulnerable, vulnerable groups such as women, uh, persons with disabilities are taken into consideration together with the youth. In Africa, the perception that uh, urban agriculture is rural and primitive, we need to change that. And we've seen that most of the beneficiaries that we target is uh, for, 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 for food security, food gardens, and any other uh, uh, programs, are not really that interested compared to those in the affluent areas. And in the city of Johannesburg, a number of food gardens in the middle class areas are actually growing faster than those in the most deprived areas. So it is very important that we, we actually take that into consideration. Lastly, I would like to say that uh, incubation works 
quite well, we have seen that. But one of the challenges that we have seen is where, uh, when you try to do the incubation, uh, the people start to put permanent structures on the municipal land, and they do not want to leave the incubation once they become commercial, commercially viable. So the bylaws are needed in that respect. And that speaks to actually aligning with other departments that are responsible for enforcement to ensure that the food security actually takes place. Um, I will actually end here. Uh, these are some of the, just the, 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 the experiences that we have uh, encountered in, in the city of Johannesburg when we're implementing our food security policy. And we are now at a point when we are reviewing the policy in line with some of these experiences. And we hope that at some point in time, we'll be able, able to have an engagement uh, with you guys in terms of how far we will have gone. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was just absolutely uh, full of such useful practical information. That was fantastic. Thank you. Um, we're running a little over. I hope you can stick around for another 10 minutes or so. We're going to take, um, I've got time for just one question, and then we'd like to tell you a little bit about the Eat Smart India Challenge just before we wrap up. A couple of questions coming through um, that I'm just going to um, respond to briefly. One question around public consultation. Uh, we're going to have um, a, a whole uh, webinar dedicated to engaging stakeholders which will be on the 4th of August, so we're going into depth um, on that topic then. Uh, another question around involving NGOs and community organisations, and again we've got a whole webinar focusing on uh, partnership working, which is on the 1st of September, so we'll be addressing lots of these questions throughout the series. Um, but I'd like to invite Nikhil um, to ask uh, the question that, that they've popped in the chat there. So you're very welcome to unmute yourself um, and ask that um, out loud if you would like to. Yeah, hi Florence, thank you. So I just wanted to ask this question regarding, you know, a city is new to developing such food policies. So do you want them to focus on all aspects of food system or any one particular aspect? And then, you know, like, I mean, how, like if they choose one particular system, one aspect of that food system, like how do they go about, you know, stepwise manner in identifying it, uh, you know, and then, you know, drafting the policy to address that uh, issue. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Would any of our speakers um, like to step in to answer that? Or I can uh, pick on one of you. Yaren? Yeah, sure, Florence. So I think that's an uh, excellent uh, question, Nikhil. And uh, I think the frustrating answer is it depends. Yeah? So uh, it depends on the urgency of the challenges within your city. Uh, it depends on the capacities that your administration has. Uh, so if, if capacities are limited, it might be very opportune to, to focus on a limited set of very urgent challenges rather than trying to solve everything from the start. Uh, so um, um, I think it might be most expedient to, to, to make an analysis of the local food system and see where your city can make the, the biggest change, uh, also given the competencies that you have, uh, given the capacities that you have. Uh, but of course, if these capacities are larger, there's much to say uh, for, for, for a more comprehensive food strategy in which you also try to connect with, uh, with some of these other uh, perhaps less urgent, uh, but still important challenges and drivers of the, of the food system. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, would anyone else like to speak on that just for a, a, a second or, a, or two? I, I could just add on i mean i think it we, we've seen the complexity you know how vast the food system is but there will obviously be areas that you need to act upon like like we've just heard so it's somehow being able to prioritize over time um as as well as related to you know resource and capacity so i think it's being able to see and learn about the whole system um because obviously this is going through long periods of time great thank you so much angela unfortunately we haven't got time for any more questions and we're going to spend the last uh, couple of minutes just introducing um the fantastic uh, eat right india um initiative so i'm just going to share my screen with you and show a short video if i can find it here here we go. 
So hopefully you can all see my screen. In 2050, the Eat Right India movement with its food systems approach has come to life. It has both demand and supply side interventions and three key pillars. Eat safe, eat healthy and eat sustainable. On the supply side, quality is assured by setting standards and food businesses are regulated through a graded approach. On the demand side, food environments are transformed to provide for the right food. Farmers, scientists and all stakeholders work in tandem. Governments and local authorities work together to support Eat Right India. A variety of tools like training, certification and mass campaigns are used. Eat Right India's Engage, Excite and Enable strategy ensures the health of people and the planet. Fantastic. So Eat Right India, we're very, very um, happy to say are one of our uh, partners on this webinar series, along with the Milan Urban Food Policy Pact and the Sustainable and Healthy Food Systems Project Chefs. Um, and it's my pleasure now to hand over to Ms. Anoshi Sharma, who's the Executive Director of the Food Safety and Standards Authority of India. Thank you so much, Florence, and a very um, good day to everybody. The Eat Right um, initiative, of course, like we've just seen in the short video, touches upon three broad pillars. Eat safe. What it really means is that whatever food we're eating, we have to make sure is prepared in a safe and hygienic condition. Because even if you're having nutritious food, but you end up having some sort of foodborne illness, it's not going to really provide you with the nutrients. Eat healthy is the second pillar, which primarily means one should eat local and seasonal diet and also have fortified staples included in it and also make sure that your diet is balanced. The third is eat sustainable. So try to reduce the use of plastic. We are also trying to work on overpackaging sometimes, which happens, ensuring proper disposal of used cooking oil and reducing the use of water during the processes stages. Now with this intention and to make sure that safety across the food chain is maintained, we initiated the Eat Smart City Challenge whereby almost 110 cities across India have registered for this challenge. In a three month uh, implementation stage, the cities will be asked to prepare a food vision for their cities. At the end of the three months, they will be shortlisted and 11 top cities will be awarded and recognized. A financial grant will be provided to them and in the next one year, they will be scaling up the programs under the Eat Right initiative. And that will be documented and shared with other cities. So with this, I would like to show you a small video about the Eat Smart City Challenge. Over to you, Florence. Thank you. I should bring up the video here. Looking through the food lens provides modern cities many interesting opportunities to develop institutional, social and economic infrastructures to ensure the health and happiness of their citizens by transforming their food ecosystems. The Eat Smart Cities Challenge is open to all cities in India that will compete to create an Eat Right vision for their cities. The challenge is focused on food safety and hygiene, promoting nutrition and healthy diets, sustainable food environments, social and behavior change. All participating cities will receive support throughout the process. Each city will implement a pilot project from the five areas of action of Eat Right India initiatives, licensing and registration of food business and surveillance drives, benchmarking and certification, changing food environments, sustainable food environment, mass mobilization. Cities will be selected to bring their vision into reality. The winning cities would create a better food future and inspire other cities. Fantastic. It is a truly exciting challenge and we're, we're so excited to see 
um, what emerges from that from, from uh, our, our colleagues over in India. So that just leads me to wrap up and say thank you so much to all of our speakers today and for all of you for joining us. And we hope you'll join us for our next webinar, which is on the 7th of July. And we'll be starting to look at what goes into a strategy, starting with policies and interventions to ensure safe and nutritious diets. And you can register for this and other webinars in a series in the, uh, the link that we'll be sharing in the chat now. My colleague Chloe is going to share that. Um, and we'll also be hosting the recordings and the shared resources um, here as well. We're also sharing a chat, um, a link in the chat to a survey uh, for those of you who are interested in the partnership so we can understand your learning needs and really tailor the content of our of our learning partnership to you. And we're really hoping to culture a community of learning through this series and the partnership. And we hope to see you joining us uh, throughout the series, learning from each other, making connections. Um, and as we've heard today and in the introductory video, strategy really cannot be delivered by a single entity. So I would invite you to invite other individuals and organizations in your city that you'll be delivering your strategy with to come and join us for the series as well so that you can learn together. And also to invite other cities in your country that you think may also be interested in developing a food strategy for their city. So that just leaves me to say thank you so much for your time and we look forward to seeing you again next time. Thank you, bye-bye.